Chapter 15 It seemed as though the corrupted forest of Shanlo was ablaze with fire. Thousands of torches flickered between the dark forms of the trees, and dark shapes moved within the twisted woodland as the massed forces of the enemy drew nearer. The entire forest was alive with movement. There was to be no escape. The enemy had entirely encircled the Bretonians, and they massed beyond the tree line, snarling and braying in eagerness for the coming bloodshed. The first of the beasts broke out of the trees, holding torches aloft, hefting spears and swords, axes and spiked clubs. Many carried foul totemic standards of twisted wood and rusty iron, from which were hung severed heads and hands, as well as battered Bretonian helmets. They were lean, sinewy creatures, twisted mockeries of humanity, with small horns protruding from their scalps and evil expressions upon their hateful faces. Many of them ran forwards, snarling and waving their weapons, before turning and slinking back to the edge of the forest. Thousands of the creatures moved within the concealing darkness of the trees. Horns blared and drums of thawed human skin were pounded. Several of the creatures strode forward and turned their matted furred backs towards the Bretonians, cocking their legs to defecate and urinate. They flicked their cloven hooves backwards, kicking their foul spoor and clods of earth in the direction of the defenders, accompanied by braying barks that might have passed for laughter. Kellard tensed in the saddle, eyes blazing with anger. Massive warhounds prowled through the darkness, growling and snapping at each other, sniffing at the air. Several of them began to howl as the clouds parted and the green glow of the chaos moon, Morslib, radiated down from the heavens. Larger beastmen began to emerge out of the trees. Massively muscled and with horns curling from their temples, they pushed their smaller brethren out of the way, their thick lips curling back as they snarled and spat. Many of these creatures bore evidence of sickening mutation. Some had ridges of bone erupting from their spines and elbows, while others had an additional arm protruding awkwardly from their shoulders, or a single weeping eye in the center of their forehead. These, it seemed to Callard, were given additional respect, and the smaller beastmen slunk around them warily. Several herds of these centaur-like monsters emerged, roaring loudly and kicking at any of the lesser beastmen that came close to them. Each of the groups held aloft a totem, upon which a horrifying, skinless body was nailed, the muscles glistening wetly. Callard was horrified to see that not all the men were dead, and he watched, aghast, as one skinless man writhed in agony, fighting against the iron spikes that had been driven into his hands and feet. His tongueless mouth opened in a silent scream of torment. He might as well have been a knight of Baston, for all Callard knew, which was kept alive for the amusement of the tormentors. Even as he watched, he saw one of the beasts poke at the man's exposed muscles with the barbed tip of a spear, laughing uproariously as the man thrashed and struggled. As he watched the enemy gather, Callard began to see what he took to be barbaric tribal distinctions. He saw one dominant group of beasts with black-painted arms, as if they had dipped their limbs in pitch. Another group had entwined briars and branches of thorns in their horns, and they snarled at any who came near them. Another group was daubed all over with blood. Their fur was drawn into spikes, maybe with lime and congealed blood giving them a demonic appearance. This red fur tribe was highly aggressive, and, even as he watched, he saw them surround one smaller, isolated beastman of another grouping and smash it to the ground with blows to the head and shoulders. The pack descended upon the fallen creature, ripping and tearing, fighting each other in their eagerness. Callard saw the beasts feasting on the entrails of the unfortunate creature, pulling on intestines with their teeth and claws and fighting over the organs. When they stepped away, mere moments later, they left a trampled, bloody, and mutilated corpse, and they smeared the creature's fresh blood across their chests. There were clearly rivalries and blood feuds between the different groups of creatures, and members of the herds fronted up to each other, snarling and smashing their weapons together, trying to prove their dominance over each other. Callard saw several violent clashes, as beasts slammed their horn heads together with bone-jarring force. Most of them were little more than scraps across their bodies, 
though others wore scraps of armor that had clearly been scrounged from fallen foes. One group had thick plate armor which had been blackened by fire and beaten to fit their body. Plates of metal had been hammered into their heads, roughly hewn and cut in to fit around their curling horns. These creatures bore immense, long-hafted axes and blades that they carried on their shoulders. Even larger creatures stalked through the milling press, hulking monsters with bloodshot eyes, standing over eight feet tall, and with the heads of bulls. The smaller ones hissed at them from behind their backs, but scurried out of their path whenever they walked. Other nameless and formless horrors crashed in the trees, hauled into the clearing by giant chains and hooks that tore at their flesh. They were sickening, mutated mounds of fur, muscle, and bone, and they screamed and howled in agony and mindless fury from mouths that opened up across their skin and emerged from the tips of writhing tentacles. They were horrid amalgamations of torsos, heads, horns, and limbs that seemed to protrude at random from their flesh and Callard felt horrified loathing as he looked upon them. Dozens of the straining beastmen dragged one of the massive beast-spawn monstrosities forward. Thick rings of iron pierced its flesh, and its skin was pulled taut, like canvas sail, by the black chains attached to them. It screamed and roared as it fought against its captors. Spines of bone and horn erupted out of its back, and it swung crab-like claws at anyone who got close. Another of the creatures was covered in open sores that wept pus and blood, and maggots writhed beneath the skin, making it ripple like a pennant in the wind. It had a pair of conjoined horse's heads, though spines had erupted above and below the eyes, and long barbed tongues flashed from their toothy maws. A massive toothed orifice gaped open in the chest of another monster, displaying thousands of inward curving teeth and an array of barbed tentacles that waved blindly. A distressingly human head came out of this fetid circular maw, a single blinking red eye peering out through the crooked teeth of its slack-jawed mouth. One of the beastmen pulling the creature forwards stumbled and fell, and was instantly lifted up in the air by a pair of malformed flipper-like appendages. It was stuffed into a flapping mouth that was too small to contain its oversized teeth. The beastman bellowed as it was devoured. Additional mouths opened upon the beast's body, and slug-like tongues lapped at the blood upon its flesh. All the while, more of the beastmen massed along the tree line, and the blare of horns and beating of drums rose to a chaotic jumbled cacophony of tortured sound. Callard saw the men-at-arms below the hill shuffle and glance around at each other, their fear palpable. The knights leading the cohorts shouted encouragement at the soldiers, but their voices were tense and strained. Gringolet whinnied nervously at the scent of the beasts as it was carried to him on the wind. Easy, said Callard, as he patted the destrier's neck in reassurance. The steeds of the knights around him flattened their ears against their heads, and one of them reared, hooves flailing out blindly, but the knight quickly got control of the mount. A tall, hellish creature stepped out of the forest, surrounded by heavily armored beastmen. It clearly commanded the respect of its minions, and silence descended around the clearing. The pounding of drums stopped mid-beat, and the horns were silenced. The braying and roaring of the beasts dropped away, and even the massive warhounds slunk low to the ground, snarling, their tails between their legs, as the creature stepped forwards. Its face was a mass of stitches, fur, and skin, and three pairs of horns erupted out of its head. It drew to a halt just meters from the forest's edge, and stared up at the Bretonians balefully. Thorns and briars flowed across the ground around it, erupting from the soil wherever the unnatural monster stood. Callard jerked as the creature's eyes fell upon him, although that was surely impossible, for the beast was hundreds of yards away. It slammed a twisted branch-like staff heavily into the ground, where it took root, bony tendrils penetrating the earth. The black birds overhead dropped like stones out of the sky, swooping low over the battlefield to come to rest upon the branches of the staff, turning their malevolent burning red eyes towards the defenders at the hill. Lifting an arm, the creature extended a long, multi-jointed finger. It looked like a slender leg of a monstrous spider as it pointed at the Bretonians. To Callard, it felt as though the creature was pointing right at him.
A mighty roar echoed across the clearing. The cacophony of noise began anew, and the beastmen began looping at a hill in the center of the clearing. From every side they came, like a wolf pack moving in for the kill. Guntar jerked awake, the sound of horns filling his ears. He reached for his sword, but hands held him down. He swore, fighting against them, thrashing and kicking. He almost passed out from the pain, but he struggled to maintain consciousness. Leave him be, said a voice, and the bodies pressing down at him eased away. Breathing heavily and covered in sweat, Guntar swung his legs over the side of the pallet and staggered to his feet, eyes darting around. His vision swam and he reeled, his left leg giving way beneath him. He caught himself and stood straight once again, although the left leg was shaking and unsteady. His feverish eyes darted around, looking at the anxious faces of the peasants who had been holding him down. What in the name of the lady is going on? Gunther managed. In the distance, he could hear the hellish sounds of the enemy. The camp is under attack, he said in shock, as realization began to sink into his fevered mind. You must lie back down, my lord, said a small middle-aged man emphatically. Gundar recognized him as Moncadas' surgeon. The aging man had a small saw in his hand, and wore a dirty apron over his slight frame. Damned if I will, snarled Gundar. The peasants were looking nervous and scared. He shouted for arms and armor, and they jumped, but didn't move to enact the order. Pain shot down his leg, and he was falling once again. He sat heavily on the pallet. His brow was covered in sweat, and his vision blurred before him. He shook his head, wiped a hand across his brow. The wound is festering, my lord, said the surgeon. You were going to take my leg, damn you, raged Guntar, realization dawning on him. The little surgeon guiltily placed the saw on a small table, upon which was laid all the kinds of knives and other implements. They looked like the tools of a torturer. The little man wrung his hands in front of him. It's the only way to save your life, my lord. And what a life that would be. No, I will not face dishonor. He licked his lips. His throat felt dry and thick. Bring me water. He ordered one of the men, and a wooden goblet was pressed into his shaking hands. He put it to his lips, not caring if it was a crude drinking vessel fit only for a peasant. The water was cool and soothing, and he knocked it back in one long swig. You would be alive, said the surgeon softly. I would rather be dead than live like that, spat Guntar. He realized he was dressed in nothing more than a gown over his underclothes and he gingerly pulled back the cloth to look upon the wound. He bit his lip as the material tore away from the wound, and he tasted blood in his mouth. His vision swam once again, but he blinked quickly, trying to focus his mind. Around three inches above the knee, the injury he sustained was angry and red, weeping a sickly-looking fluid, the flesh around it rotting and festering. He gagged at the stink of the wound, despite the honey smeared over it. He had seen enough wounds in his time as a knight to know that if the leg was not removed, the wound would kill him. He stared at it in shock for a moment and swore under his breath. He heard men shouting orders outside in the gloom and the roar of the enemy. Gundar's gaze hardened and he turned towards the surgeon's underlings. They were still standing around awkwardly, uncertain what to do. My arms and armor, damn you, he shouted, making them jump again. Go and get them now, and bring me my horse. The man looked at the surgeon nervously. What are you looking at him for? I am a knight of Baston, and you will obey me, or I shall see you hang. Go now. The man fled, running to fulfill Guntar's orders. You are in no state to fight, my lord, the small man said with serious conviction. Guntar swung his fevered gaze towards the diminutive surgeon, bristling in anger. The man's face was lined with concern, and he felt the anger seep out of him. He was so tired. It felt as if he had been kicked and trampled by a wild stallion. Everything hurt, 
He sighed, shoulders sagging. I know, he said finally. But I will not lie here while others are dying. I will not lie to you. Amputating a leg is not without risk, said the little surgeon softly. I have performed a procedure twenty-three times before. Seven of those men died in loss of blood, and your age will count against you. But if the limb is not amputated, you will die, no question. What good will you do to Bretonia then? He looked at Gunther with weary eyes. You are right, said Gunther with resignation. My death might well mean nothing. Whether I fight or not will not alter the outcome of this battle. He sighed wearily, talking more to himself than to the surgeon. Fighting Ganelon was humbling. Fifteen years ago I would have bested him without breaking a sweat. That duel made me feel old. You still won, said the surgeon softly. Yes, and a skillful knight of Bretonia died, said Gunthar. Who is to say what great things he might have achieved had he lived? We will never know. Gunthar laughed softly and without humor. You could have many more years ahead of you, my lord. Who is to say what great things you could achieve? Perhaps. But I have no wish to live out the remainder of my days as an invalid, an embarrassing cripple unable to fight for Lord when the call is sounded. I could not live like that. So you choose to die? I choose to die as a knight of Bretonia, Gunther said weakly. I will ride to battle with my sword in my hand and with the enemy in front of me. And if such is to be my fate, I will die. The surgeon sighed, looking dejected and exhausted. I am not a warrior, said the little man. I abhor violence in all its forms. I believe that life is a precious gift, and that it should not be set aside lightly. I have held the hands of hundreds of men as they died in torment from sickening wounds. I have seen countless knights screaming in agony, tears of shame rolling down their faces as they lost control of their bodily functions. I have seen knights weep like babies as they try to hold their insides from spilling out of their belly. I see no pride in their deaths. I am not of noble birth, and as such perhaps I am incapable of understanding these things. Despite all that, I will respect your wish, even if I disagree with it. A man should always be allowed to make his own choice on how he lives or dies. Good. Now help me up, damn you, said Gunthar. A single arrow was loosed, soaring high into the air. Hold, damn you! The arrow arched high into the air before reaching the top of the trajectory. It seemed to hang in the sky a moment, defying the forces that were pulling it back to earth before hurtling back into the ground, sinking into the earth several hundred yards in front of the advancing mass of bodies. Giant hounds, mutated far beyond their natural size, pounded across the grass, their tongues lolling from slavering mouths. They streamed out in a wave before the beastmen running swiftly behind them. Like a deadly tide, they swarmed towards the Bretonian line. Callard had to restrain his urge to drive the heels into Gringolet's sides and charge out to meet them head on. He could see that Bertelis was struggling with the same thing. I hate letting them come to us, his half-brother said. The peasants will break and flee, mark my words. There is nowhere for them to flee, remarked one of the knights at their side. Bertelis grunted in response. More of the enemy were streaming from the trees on all sides, spilling out like arterial blood from a slashed vein. Lady above, but there's a lot of them, said Callard. At the base of the hill, stray arrows were loosed by the Garamond bowmen, despite the shouted orders to hold. Callard swore and kicked his steed forward, leaving the formation. He thundered down the hill and rode along the front of the lines of peasants. He swung the horse around, face angry. The next man that looses an arrow before he is ordered to do so will be cut down, here and now, he roared 
You will wait for the order. He turned to face the enemy, which was racing across the field in a solid mass, and lifted his lance high into the air. The night was lit with hundreds of torches and braziers, and though the moons had not yet risen, the numberless horde of the enemy could be easily picked out. Hold! he shouted, voice carrying over the righteous din. The open ground before the archers had been paced out, and Callard had memorized the distances. The closest enemy was still about 350 yards away. Though an exceptionally strong bowman might be able to fire such a distance, it was still too far a shot to be effective. Hold! The enemy closed with sickening speed, far quicker than a man could, and Callard felt a bead of sweat run down the side of his face. The slavering hounds in front began to outdistance the beastmen behind, racing over the grass with bounding leaps. Callard blinked the sweat out of his eyes, still holding the lance aloft. The enemy leapt the low scrub bushes that roughly marked 300 yards away. He resisted the urge to drop his lance and order the attack. He could see more detail on the creatures now, the angry brands which had been seared into the flesh of the monstrous hounds, the bronze-covered tusks that sprouted from the massive jaws of the largest of beasts. Draw! roared Callard and the archers drew back their bowstrings, lifting the long weapons high. The lead warhound, a monster of gigantic size with rows of horns sprouting out of its head, passed a stand of low rocks marking the 250-yard mark. Now! he roared, lowering the lance in the direction of the enemy. As one, the bowman loosed, and hundreds of arrows hissed into the air. It looked like a dense flock of birds streaking high into the sky. Before reaching the fullness of their flight, a second volley was loosed. The third was fired just as the first volley struck home. There were roars of pain as they sliced down into the massed enemy with lethal force. Scores fell as the arrows slammed home, driving through muscle and flesh. The enemy was too distant for the archers to pick out individual targets, but that didn't matter. They were so densely packed that almost every arrow found a mark. The second volley struck and Callard saw more beasts stumble and fall as the lethal shafts slammed into unprotected necks, heads and shoulders. A pair of arrows had driven into the thick neck of a hound leading the pack, but it was barely slowed. All around Adeline's seat, thousands of arrows were loosed in those first volleys, and countless hundreds of the enemy were felled. Those that didn't die were trampled into the ground by those following them. Still, on the enemy came charging through the devastating volleys towards the Bretonian line. As the distance closed, the bow fire became even more effective, and innumerable foes were cut down by the relentless storm of arrows. Beasts arrived in agony, pulling themselves forward with their hands, desperate to be part of the carnage that was about to erupt. The ground was littered with thousands of twitching bodies that struggled to rise, only to be crushed by the hooves and claws of those pressing forward behind them. Then, the first wave of the enemy struck the Bretonian line, and the real bloodshed began. The heart of Radegar was beating fiercely, his breath rapid and shallow as the twisted beast of the forest screamed around him. He clenched his hands around the rough-hewn shaft of the polearm and licked his cracked lips, determined not to show any fear. It had been a fine day when he was chosen to join the Garamond soldiery. He didn't know how old he was maybe fourteen, and he had lined up alongside two hundred other young men, trying to stand tall and straight. He was in awe as he stood beneath the shadow of the grand castle of his lord, and he had gaped open-mouthed at the figure of Lord Lethor, flanked by a dozen knights of the realm fully garbed in their battle armor. His heart had raced then as well. Don't slouch, his father said to him before he left his home that morning, two hours before dawn. And if you are not chosen, do not return, for we cannot feed you. He had traveled by wagon that morning, along with the other hopefuls. Once a year, all the eligible peasants under Garamond's protection traveled to the castle in the hope of being picked to join the men-at-arms. The wagon had been filled with boys his age, each one of them dreaming of joining the esteemed ranks of the soldiery. He had puffed out his chest as the giant, scarred yeoman had stalked in front of the line of hopefuls, a deep scowl upon his face. 
Fully half the gathered peasants he dismissed out of hand for being too small or weak from malnutrition. Others were dismissed because of their hunched backs, or because one of their limbs was wasted or useless, and others because they were simple in the head. Unlike his younger brother, who had passed into more scare the previous winter, Radegar was lucky enough to have been born with two arms and two legs, and his hands were fully functional, even though he had six fingers on the left one. He was broad-shouldered, though when they relaxed, they tended to slump inwards, and his arms were strong from hard labor. Every time the brutal yeoman stalked past, Radegar would pull his shoulders square and stand tall, trying to look as strong and capable as possible. Nervousness had clawed at him as the group was whittled down, and his heart soared as he was chosen to pass through the next round of cuts. The remaining boys had been given wooden staves and organized into pairs. Radegar had been paired up with a boy from his own village, who was tall for his age. In the bout which followed, Radegar had knocked the boy senseless. He didn't feel any remorse. He grinned like an idiot when he was chosen to join the ranks of the men-at-arms, and he had willingly sworn his oath before the castellan with eleven others that had been deemed worthy. He had been given five copper coins, and his hands were shaking as he held them. He had never seen such a princely sum of money, let alone held it in his hands. One of the coins was taken from him instantly, to pay for the cost of his burial should he fall in battle. Three others were used to pay for the weapon, the tabard, his leather cap, and his board. He had felt seven feet tall when he wore the tabard, after he had scrubbed out the blood of the previous owner. It was Castellan Lefeur's duty to provide protection for those in the service, and he had fulfilled this commitment by presenting each of the recruits with a long, rectangular shield, bearing the Garamond colors and heraldry. They had seen much service already, but Radegard didn't care. Of course, if he allowed the shield to be damaged, or, Shalia forbid, he lost it, he would be taxed accordingly. But Radegar was too thrilled at receiving the post to be concerned. His final copper coin went to pay for training, although he had received two copper bits after his first six months of service. Proudly, he had organized one of them to be given to his family, and the other had gone towards his board. It had been such a proud day for him, receiving his first pay. Since then, four years had passed, and now, at around eighteen, he was regarded as a veteran. He fought in two battles and killed three of his lord's enemies. In the second battle, he himself was almost killed, but he had defied death and recovered from his wounds. But he had never been face to face with a foe like this. The big, scarred yeoman that had selected him four years earlier stood nearby, a perpetual scowl stamped upon his face. The man seemed undaunted by anything, and he stood glaring at the approaching enemy, his thick-bladed sword held in his right hand. Even though the weapon was missing a tip and bore more than a hint of rust, that the yeoman was allowed to bear a sword at all was testament to the level of trust placed in him. Radegar wouldn't allow himself to show any fear in front of him, who he still regarded with a mix of fear and respect. More than the presence of this brutal yeoman, however, it was the fact that the Knight of the Realm was in their ranks which made Radegar swell with pride and push his fear deep inside. The knight's helmet was high and had a miniature dragon upon the crest, and his armor gleamed in the flickering light given off by the braziers nearby. Radegar was deeply honored to be standing alongside one of the nobility, and he swore that he wouldn't fail in his duty. No. It would be a fate far worse than death to quake in fear in front of such a noble knight. Surely as long as the regal knight stood against the enemy, they would hold. The enemy now bore down upon them, screaming and roaring, even as hundreds of flights of arrows continued to pepper their ranks from the hillside behind. This is it, boys, bellowed the yeoman. Don't you shame me now, or I'll cut off your ears and eat them for breakfast. For Garamond! Radegar braced himself. He leant his left shoulder forwards, so that his shield protected him and the man to his left, just as the man to the right protected him. Each of the men-at-arms carried a long pole arm, and the spikes of these unwieldy weapons were lowered to create a nigh-on impenetrable wall of death. 
The first of the gigantic hellhounds leapt between two of the heavy wooden stakes which had been driven into the ground in front of the men-at-arms. Its immense shoulders were covered in mangy matted fur, and its eyes reflected the flames of the braziers. It hurled itself at the dragon helmet knight, and its massive paws slammed into his armored chest, bowling him backwards even as his sword blade penetrated the beast's chest. With one savage bite, the knight's head, helmet and all, was ripped off his shoulders, and blood sprayed out like a fountain. The beast's thick body was impaled by the pole arms, but it had done its job, and Radegar felt panic begin to rise behind him. It had happened so quickly. He would have no time to think, as scores of the massive hounds struck the line. Radegar thrust his pole arm forward, taking one of the beasts squarely in the chest. The force of the beast's momentum knocked him back a step, into the men behind him, and his feet slipped into the mud. He saw the scowling yeoman hack his blade into the side of the head of another monster, the sword biting deep. Radegar pulled his weapon back, and with a shout he thrust again, feeling the weapon bite into flesh. The man to his right dropped to his knees as a massive weight dragged his shield low, and in the next instant a snarling beast tore his face off with a snap of his jaws. The axe head of a pole arm slammed down into the beast's skull, cracking it like a nut, and it died instantly. Men were shouting in fear, panic and anger, and order began to be lost. More holes were made in the shield wall as men died, some as their arms were savagely ripped out of their sockets by the monstrous hounds, and others as massive jaws ripped at their throats, spraying blood wildly. Radegar shouted wordlessly as he struck. A heavy weight slammed against his shield, and he was pushed back again. In that moment, Radegar knew that the line was going to break, and that he was going to die. A hulking, goat-legged creature appeared before him, its snarling face that of an animal's, although its eyes burned with a feral intelligence. It held a curved blade in one hand and leapt at him. Radegar thrust his weapon desperately at the creature. It swayed aside from the point, grabbed the haft of the polearm with one thick hand, and pulled it violently away. Radegar was jerked forwards, stumbling off balance towards the beast man. The beast weapon flashed, and Radegar screamed as it sliced deep into his shoulder, cleaving flesh and muscle, and striking the bone with crippling force. His weapon dropped from fingers that he could no longer feel, and he fell to the ground before the massive creature. Its stench was overpowering, like rotting meat in urine and it loomed above him, swinging its murderous blade. I am dead, thought Radegar. Cloven hooves pounded as the enemy drove over the top of him. He was kicked in the head, and felt one of his legs break as a heavy cloven hoof stamped down upon the limb. Moaning in agony and fear, he waited for the fatal blow to fall, praying to Shalia that it would be quick. Rough hands gripped him around the armpits, and he cried out in pain. Eyes lolled around in their sockets, and his body was slick with blood. But for a moment, he thought he was being rescued, carried free of the battle. A glimmer of hope flickered within him. But that hope was dashed away as eyes came into focus. He was being dragged away from the Bretonian line. An animal groan of panic escaped his lips, and he began to fight against the stinking monsters holding him away. He kicked out and thrashed around. Hands slick with blood slipped and Radegar was dropped heavily to the ground. There was an angry snarl, and the hoof struck him in the side of the head. He tasted blood in the mouth, and spat out shattered teeth. The beast grabbed him around the broken leg, and began dragging him backwards through the mud, and he screamed again. The shield, the precious shield bearing the honorable heraldry of Garamond, was still attached to his arm, and it carved a furrow in the earth behind him. Then, blessedly, he was released from the torment as he slipped into unconsciousness. What in the lady's name are they doing? breathed Callard in horror. Scores of men at arms were being hauled away from the front line by the beastmen. They were being dragged, kicking and screaming, back towards the distant tree line, where the monstrous tall beast stood pacing back and forth like a caged animal, surrounded by its heavily armored kind. He had no time to consider the grim fate of these men, however, as trumpets blared, and the order to charge was declared. Callard slammed down the visor of his simple, unadored helmet, and kicked Gringolet into a gallop. 
All around Adeline's seat, knights were charging. The ranks of the men-at-arms opened up before the knight's errand, and they charged through the gap. They covered fifty yards in seconds, and Callard felt the thrill of battle wash over him. Beastmen streamed into the gap created by the parting ranks of the infantry, and lances were lowered. Tensing for the impact, Callard kicked his target, a hulking brute with horns spiraling from its forehead, wielding a pair of rusty cleavers. The knights plowed into the enemy, and Callard's lance took the enemy squarely in the chest, punching through its ribcage. It fell to the ground, blood pumping from the wound, tearing the lance from Callard's hands, and the sword flashed into his hand in an instant. Swinging the blade in a low arc, Callard carved a bloody slash across the neck of another enemy, and it fell with a scream even as another lance tore through its shoulder, smashing it to the ground. On, the knight's errant charged, driving into the enemy ranks and smashing them aside. Spears and blades glanced off shields and armor, and dozens of beastmen were crushed into the ground, trampled into pulp beneath the hooves of the destriers. The ground trembled beneath the charge of the knights. Nothing could stand in their path. Surging into the press, the formation swung to the north, riding hard in front of the line of angled stakes, tearing through the enemy pushing forwards there. Faced with enemies on two sides, the beastmen fought desperately, many of them turning towards this new enemy only to be cut down by the men-at-arms, who, at that moment, surged forwards through the stakes, stabbing and cutting. Hundreds more beastmen surged forwards at the knights, screaming as they ran, covering the ground with swift leaps and bounds. They came on in an endless tide, and the air was filled by their braying roars. Callard shattered the horns and skull of another beast with a downward strike, and reeled backwards in the saddle as a blade slammed into his shield, almost knocking him from the saddle. He fought for balance, arm tingling from the impact, but remained in tight formation with the other knights. The knights errant swung around in a wide arc, cutting and killing, struggling to maintain their momentum. A monstrous form burst out from the tide of foes, tossing beastmen aside in its eagerness to kill. Its immense, mutated form was covered in spines of bone and snapping jaws, and rents in its flesh gaped open, exposing countless mouths and tongues that arrived like serpents. It trailed the lengths of chain behind it, and rampaged forwards, needing no goading now that a scent of blood was in the air. A myriad of bloodshot eyes on stalks swung towards the knights, and it screamed in pain and bloodlust, the sound ripping forth from half a dozen throats. With a shout, the knights angled towards the monstrosity, cutting down the savage beastmen in their path. A thick neck of glistening exposed muscle burst from within the hulking mass, and snapping jaws closed around the neck of a horse, even as five lances drove home into the beast. Arms ending in bony spurs punched forward, skewering knights and tearing them from their saddle, and lashing tentacles wrapped around steeds, burrowing through flesh and eye sockets, dragging them down. Callard slashed with his sword, severing half a dozen eye stalks that spurted black, hissing blood as they were caught, and the remaining eyes retracted within the monstrous creature's body. More lances and swords plunged into its malformed bulk, and its lifeblood gushed out in a torrent, spurting from a dozen wounds. It flopped on the ground, thrashing madly in a death spasm, killing another two knights as it died. A spear smashed into the side of Callard's helmet, and he reeled, ears ringing, and he saw scores of beastmen closing in around them. He kicked Gringolet forward with a shout, and the knights were around them galloping clear, leaving the dying monstrosity behind. A horse screamed as a swinging axe chopped its legs from beneath it, and it screamed as it fell, the knight borne upon the beast sailing into the air. The knight directly behind the fallen warhorse had no time to react, and his teeth broke its front legs as it stumbled over the flailing beast. The fallen knights were set upon instantly by savage beastmen, their helmets caved in with powerful blows. Galloping directly towards Adeline's seat, the massed forces of the enemy scattering before them, the knights errant urged their steeds on. The men-at-arms again parted before them, and they thundered through the gap. The ranks closed behind them, and it was only then that Callard saw how many of his comrades had fallen. Suddenly fearful, he glanced around to look for his brother. Bertalus was there, at his side, 
armor spattered with blood, and he exhaled in relief. Lifting his visor, Bertalus gave him a savage grin. Bloodied, the knight's errant cantered up the hillside and wheeled around to face the battle once more. Peasants ran forwards, handing fresh lances to them and passing them flagons of water. Hundreds of the beastmen were still streaming from the trees in a relentless tide, and Callard felt a stab of panic. He had barely survived the first charge, but it made virtually no impact against the enemy. Breathing heavily, he took a sip of water, before passing the skin back to a peasant and making ready for another charge. It was going to be a very long night. <laughs>